our ability to uh, recognize intelligence is really uh, optimized for medium-sized objects moving at medium speeds through three-dimensional space. So, so all of our sense organs point outwards. We're like we can recognize uh, primates, uh, crows, uh, you know, parrots, maybe dolphins, uh, things like that. Right? We, we're pretty good at that. We're not, not great, but you know, okay. Uh, but imagine, imagine if we evolved with a primary sense of your blood chemistry. Imagine you had like a tongue or something inside where you could you could constantly feel twenty different parameters of your blood chemistry. I think in that case. A, we would live in a high dimensional space and we would know that we would, we would feel internally. We're not, it's not just this, it's this like this, this high dimensional space. And I think we would have no problem recognizing our liver, our kidneys and various other organs as intelligent agents navigating that space. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 151. And this episode is with Michael Levin, who is a distinguished professor in the biology department at Tufts University, where he holds the Vannevar Bush Endowed Chair. And he's also associate faculty at the Wyss Institute at Harvard University. And this conversation was terrific because it totally changed the way I think about two very fundamental concepts in life intelligence, and then life itself. Though I, I now have plenty more questions than I started with, but that's a very good thing because it means it was very, very fruitful. And I'm looking forward to continuing to pick Michael's brain on this topic and more beyond. So anyway, Michael and the Levin Lab work on a lot of things, developmental biology, artificial life, and cognitive science are, are just a few of them. In this episode, we discuss what it means, if anything determinant, to be intelligent or to be alive before turning to the various fascinating ways that collective intelligence, uh, maybe that's redundant because as Michael puts it there, he is unaware of any singular entity, a monad that is intelligent. So ways in which intelligence at all levels of the spectrum from microbes to synthetic chimeras adaptively solve complex problems with sophisticated cognition uh, more particularly among other things we talk about planaria that regenerate exploded brains uh, slime molds that navigate obstacles and how Michael uses synthetic life to learn what cells do when they're divorced from their programming by natural selection. And here I'm referring to Xenobots. Likes, comments, reviews, subscribes, please, very please, Spotify, Apple, wherever you're listening. So amazingly helpful. And now, without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Michael. Your undergraduate degree is in computer science and biology, and then your PhD is in genetics, and then the Levin Lab studies artificial intelligence, embryology, synthetic biology and more. And since in an hour or two, we can only touch on a few of these things, I wanted to begin by asking just what it is that unites all of these interests. Is there some unifying question or goal that brings your research program together? There is. Uh, and there has been from the beginning, although the kind of, uh, let's say, outward facing statement of it has changed over the years because uh, as the work moves forward, it becomes easier to okay, kind of explain certain things. So uh, there's a I, I keep a mind map of everything we do at work, and this mind map I, I've printed out that on on this like um, silk poster. It's this giant you know thing. Uh, this is, I think nine feet across or something that hangs in the lab. And the center the center uh, the center node of that mind map says embodied mind. So that's what I think we're doing. What I think we're doing <clears throat> is working to understand how minds can come to exist in the physical universe, how they scale, uh, how they operate, how they change over time, 
uh, how they relate to their parts and to other systems of which they are a part. Um, how can we use that information to better recognize mines and unconventional substrates, how to um, ethically relate to them, how to use this kind of thing for uh, regulating a, a mind such as uh, the, the collective intelligence of your body cells, which immediately has applications to biomedicine and to other things. So it sort of touches on some some fairly philosophical things, but also some intensely practical things. I mean, I think these these issues have very uh, practical implications and impacts. And so, and so that's what ties it all together. It's a desire to understand embodied mind. Okay. And yeah, I think that we will, will hopefully get to both the theoretical and the practical aspects of your work. I think the place to start though is the theoretical and going hand in hand with the notion of a mind is intelligence. And though I think it's fair to say that intelligence is really a family of ideas. I mean, when we say a dog is intelligent, we mean something different than when we say a person intelligent. But we think of intelligence in the vernacular, that in the vernacular at least, as being a measure maybe of knowledge or of creativity or problem solving capacity. And in this sense, it's usually applied to an agent. But as you already indicated by referring to the collective intelligence of the cells in our body, you construe intelligence as something different that doesn't just arise out of individuals, but collectives. And maybe we could start by talking about just what you mean when you talk about intelligence. Yeah. Well, I guess the first thing just to say before I forget is that uh, I, I don't know of any intelligence that is not a collective. So I'm unaware of any truly uh, monadic unified intelligences. Everything is made of parts. You and I are collective intelligences, I would argue. So so, so we can we can get into the weeds on that. The, the only thing um, I want to say up front, uh, which is worth saying, is uh, a little bit about how I take definitions of these kinds of words. Because it, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you how, what, what I, how I define these, these things. And, and I think I want to say first uh, kind of a little bit of a meta mm, um, discussion on, on what, what, what I think these definitions are for. So, so I like, so, so a couple things. I like definitions that have uh, practical um, uh, empowering consequences. I don't like definitions that constrain research. I don't like definitions that uh, produce boundaries where there, there don't have to be boundaries. I like unification. I like symmetries between concepts. I like finding new invariants between things that we thought were different things. And and when we when we use these words, and and so and so another another uh, kind of thing to think about is, I often use use these words, and and people say, uh, but that's not what the average person thinks the, the, you know means by that. And so one can do one of two things. You can either try to come up with theories that honor the way that colloquially people use words, or you can try to, uh, I, I think it's the job of scientists and philosophers to lead and to produce better definitions and let everybody else catch up. And so, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to use definitions that I think are uh, practical, empowering, um, uh, that facilitate future research. They may not exactly map onto the consequences that we use in everyday life. And the, and that has to catch up and not the other way around that that's kind of how I how I feel about these things um I'm also I mean, part of that part of that view of course is this idea that these definitions are not meant to be uh unique and objective so so when I give a definition the only thing I'm saying is here is one that I like because it facilitates research in this way if somebody else has another definition that facilitates their progress fabulous right so I'm not claiming that that this is unique or this is the only way to do it so, um, having said all that, uh, here here are some some uh, definitions. So, so for intelligence, what I uh, I like William James's definition of intelligence. So William James said that it is the, some degree of the ability to reach the same goal by different means. So this is I, I think it's cool because it doesn't say anything about brains. It doesn't say anything about whether you're desi uh, 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 an, an engineered system or a naturally evolved system. It's a very cybernetic definition. It says that you pick a problem space and as an observer of some system you pick a problem space that you would that you see the system operating in you pick some set of states that you think are goals that the system is trying to achieve and then you can make empirical 
hypotheses about how much competency that system has to reach those goals when things go wrong. So we, you, the various barriers, various breakdowns in the, in the system itself and the world around it, um, how, much, how much competency does it have to navigate that space? And so a couple of useful things out of that definition. One is that it isn't binary which is really important. I, I, I really hate it when people say, is it intelligent or is it a machine? You know, I, I think it's a terrible question. I, I, think it's a, I think it's a continuum, of course. That's, that's A. B, it allows you to apply these concepts to radically different systems. So you might want to ask, like, what do all agents have in common uh, from, from highly diverse origin stories and compositions? So you might have uh, you might have a synthetic um, uh, life and you might have uh, uh, swarms of bees and you might have um, some sort of alien life if we ever find any. You might have software AIs and you might have uh, various hybrid and cyborg uh, kind of constructs. What, what binds them all together? So that's a cool uh, aspect of that definition is that you can, in theory, apply it to everything. I like the fact that it's relative and observer centric. So the question really it is, isn't... Um, you know, what's the objective uh, set of intelligent things that this system has? It's it's what perspective do you bring to that system as an observer that allows you to optimally interact with it? So, you know, you could have a view of the human brain as an awesome paperweight that has the competency of seeking, the, you know, sort of gravity, um, you know, potential energy um, and, and, and gravity and all that. And it'll hold down some papers and that's a frame that you bring somebody else might bring a much better frame by recognizing that wait a minute there's a whole other set of spaces that this thing is is competent in, and that's that's much much more interesting right so i like that um i like the uh the fact that uh it's uh it it facilitates research because it takes problems that a lot of people think of are as as philosophical problems so 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 a lot of people have Mm, commitments to that's just whatever that can't be intelligent or this you know this must be intelligent but these are all you you can't I, I don't believe that you can get to any of those things from an armchair i think you have to do experiments so this definition of intelligence forces you as 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 a scientist or an observer or a conspecific or whatever you're going to be to to make claims say okay here's the problem space here are the goals i think it has here are the competencies that i think it has and then you get to find out how good that frame is. You do experiments and you find out that, well, I've, I radically overestimated or underestimated the competency of the system. And so we get to find out who's, who's got the better, uh, the better frame or, or maybe there are multiple equivalent frames. But, but the point is, uh, it becomes an empirical question. It's not something you can have feelings about. If, if uh, somebody says to me, that's definitely not intelligent, my question is, well, what experiments have you done? Have you, have you, what, what have you checked? Because, because one of the things that we've actually found is we, we've, we've been working on a number of very, um, I don't want to say simple, but minimal systems that you wouldn't think are capable of much. And you get surprises. You get a lot of surprises if you're willing to ask the question instead of making assumptions. So, so that's my definition. My definition, it's, I, I stay away from, for now anyway, issues of consciousness, issues of first person perspective. I'm talking about observer accessible external observer and by the way the observer can be the system itself if it's complex enough uh observer accessible uh problem solving competencies in some problem space that's my difference okay great there's a lot there which is awesome uh i'd like to start though at the beginning just to clarify something and you said that as far as you're aware there are no monadic intelligences so considering people i mean our folk intuitions see people as individuals, but what you're pointing out is that even though in day-to-day -day life, we might look at people and say, oh, this is Michael, he's singular. The intelligence that you exhibit comes from the collective of cells that is your body, essentially. Your well, mind. Two, yeah, I mean, two, two things there. One, one um, it is true that one of the cool things about the kind of collectives that we are is that there is a higher order entity that can be the subject of uh, of knowledge of preferences of um, of behaviors that no individual part can have. So, for example, if you've got a rat and you've trained the rat to press a lever and get a reward, the cells that interact with the lever are not the cells that get the actual reward, right? And the associative learning, when you say that the pressing of the lever is associated with getting the reward, that information is owned by the rat. So there, there absolutely is a sense in which I'm not saying we don't exist, of course, but absolutely there's a high level causally potent entity that exists. However, uh, my claim is that that's not because it is somehow this unified 
thing that's radically different from ant call you know ant colonies and bee swarms and other things we are also a collective intelligence of cells and the coolest thing about it is that the interactions between those cells do give rise to this higher order real it, 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 high level individual right so that's cool but also um you know people people do do think of each other as unified individuals and that's pretty good most of the time but we know from split brain patients from dissociative states from fighting yourself in way fighting your future self in ways you know when people who are if you're the kind of person that um likes to uh snack in the middle of the night and you really uh would like to prevent that you might uh you know, uh, lock your refrigerator and throw the keys uh, somewhere where you're not going to be able to get them at midnight. You know, people do all this kind of stuff. They manipulate their environment because there are parts of you. There's a part of you that wants this to happen. There's another part of you that doesn't want it to happen. They're pretty devious. Both parts are. You have have abilities to uh, to to uh, have different goals and to try to meet them. There are pa- patients with serious dissociative states where there could be any number of personalities. This is this idea that we're um, kind of fundamentally a unified thing is even even without getting into the whole cellular basis of it is just you know i i don't i don't think it's it's correct for much but but for most of the time during the day of course that you know that tends to work out okay okay so the the crucial first component of your response is that the idea of a collective intelligence is in no way incompatible with there being an emergent subject in fact it's required right if there's going to be an emergence i mean again we are all made of parts and uh Sometimes I, I give another talk to called uh, why robots don't get cancer, right? And this is the idea that if you have a very flat architecture where the collective is intelligent, but the parts are pretty dumb. So you, you, know, you, you make some kind of a robot out of you know, transistors. They don't have an agenda. Uh, they never defect into cancer. They're just, they, they don't, they don't have a, a life of their own, but, but the collective does, uh, we are not that kind of architecture. We are, we are agential at every scale of organization, um, down to the molecular networks, I think. And, uh, yeah, and and that's in no way incompatible with each of those levels having uh, a reality of it, you know, a, rea- a causal potency of its own. Well, the second thing that I wanted to talk about regarding intelligence before we move on to another of these crucial concepts is that you said the definition isn't binary, and this is a feature. It's a continuum that <laughs> might be populated by uh, computers, aliens, chimeras, cyborgs, all sorts of things. And I'm wondering then what is what binds the continuum just this that everything that is somewhere on it has some capacity to solve problems by various alternative means and that's what means that they have some degree of intelligence yeah um so so back in 2018 or so i was at a at a conference uh, that that uh, templeton puts on in diverse intelligence institute conference and pranab das uh, challenged us to come up with a framework for being able to compare, contrast, and think about radically different kinds of intelligences in the same, you know, in the same framework, basically. Right? And so, and so, people were thinking octopus and uh, you know the bees and things like that. And and I and I really wanted to uh, push this uh, all the way outward. And I said we should. I I tried for one that could really accommodate. Everything, everything basically that I could think of, including you know cyborgs and aliens and everything else. Um, so my my in my, my the thing that my framework uh, focuses on is something I call the cognitive light cone. So the idea is that every agent uh, has some what what unites all of them, and we can talk about how far down it goes. But what unites all of them is some ability to pursue goals. Maybe and 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 what's different about all of them is the scale of those goals and so you can do something very simple you can you can make a map and it looks looks a little bit like a minkowski sort of diagram where you have three dimensions of space on one axis one dimension of time and then you can simply plot a, a shape on that space which are the scale of spatio the the biggest sp- the 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 spatio temporal limits of the biggest goal you can maintain so it's not how far out your senses see it's not how far out your effectors can affect it's what's the size of the biggest goal state that you can actively pursue. So if you're a bacterium, you can have a tiny little cognitive light cone, which is basically the sugar concentration right around that bacterium and a little bit of memory going back because the, because that's what they use to, to navigate up gradients. If you're a dog, you can have a much bigger cognitive light cone, uh, but, but the limits there are, for example, um, you know, as far as we know, and all of this is empirically, you should you have to be empirically tested. So I'm just giving you a hypothesis. As far as I know, 
you cannot make a dog care about what's going to happen three weeks from now, a couple of miles over. It's just that that cognition isn't going to do it. So, so the cognitive lycone has that limit way bigger than the bacterium, but you know, limited. Humans can have a, a massively large lycone. So, so you might be interested in what happens to um, the financial markets hundreds of years from now. You might care about world peace, like literally world peace. Uniquely, humans might have goals that are longer than our lifespan. In other words, goals that are guaranteed not to be achievable by us it, within our lifetime, and that might create some psychological pressures. I don't know, but um, but so so the idea is that uh, that concept of the of the light cone is a way to uh, try to say in the in this in this kind of generic cybernetic framework. What do the, all of these things have in common across that continuum that you and I were just talking about? And so, and 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 of course, that light cone can can grow and shrink. So when you're part of part of why I, I think we absolutely have to make it a continuum and not binary is that you and I were cells once, like single cells. In fact, we were quiescent oocytes, which people would look at and say, "Oh, that's just physics." I hate that that term, but people say that's just physics. And then slowly but surely, that single quiescent oocyte becomes what it, you know whatever it is that we are. And there is no magic lightning bolt during developmental biology nor during the evolution of history that says now you've gone from from physics to true cognition, right? So, so I think if we take any of that seriously, you have to look at the enlargement of that of that cognitive light cone in various spaces, not just the behavioral three dimensional space, but transcriptional space, physiological state space, anatomical state space, eventually linguistic space, and so on. Hmm. Well, something very nice about this cognitive light cone idea is that it's conceivably testable on some level for everything on the continuum, but also another thing that's so powerful about having a continuum of intelligence in the first place is that you aren't going to be running into frustrating paradoxes that might hinder research, like which as you pointed out is the hallmark of a bad definition. And what I have in mind is that people won't constantly be challenging you with arguments about vague predicates, like trying to find weaknesses in the boundary between intelligence and the lack of intelligence. You just get to totally side skirt these philosophical issues. I agree with that. Uh, these binary definitions, uh, they're like, um, they're like the word adult, you know, we, we all know nothing happens on your 18th birthday, but, but, but you use it in, in society because it makes certain things easier. But, but as scientists, we, we need to do better than that. And we have to remember that there's all kinds of weird pseudo problems that come up when you start asking, is it or isn't it? It's just, it, it gets you into all these, all these dead ends. And, and the other thing to, to, to say here too, is that all of this is, is empirical in the sense that when you assign a putative IQ to some system or a cognitive light cone boundary, you are in effect taking an IQ test yourself because all you're saying is, this is the best I've been able to come up with to interact with that system. And somebody else might come along and say, whoa, you, you, you missed it all. There's a much more interesting space, a much bigger light cone. There's all this cool stuff it knows how to do. You missed it. Right. And so, and so that's, that's fine. That's, that, this is all empirical and it's all meant to be, uh, to be, to be tested. And, and if somebody else has a better, you know, a better frame on it, uh, f fantastic because, because there is no guarantee when you, when you look at something and you make these hypotheses, there's no guarantee that you actually found the best that the system is capable of. you you reveal your, we, we all reveal our own limitations when we, when we, you know, based on what we do and don't see the system doing. Hmm. Well, we'll come back to intelligence, but another big idea that functions in your work and has already come up with regard to the continuum is life and synthetic life. So once upon a time when the world was simpler and vitalism was still an idea, we could cling to the hope that there really was some magical distinction between the dead and the living. But today that distinction has been replaced with another continuum of, I mean, simple molecules on the one end and then creatures like us on the other. So this this continuum, I think, is probably going to be different from the intelligence continuum in crucial ways. Maybe I'm wrong, but how do you think of this one and what qualities determine the ends of the spectrum? Yeah, um, to be honest, uh, I, y y you know, I, I mean, cl clearly people do think about this and, and if you, uh, you know, you could have Sarah Walker on, then she'll, she'll say some very interesting things about life. Um, I don't think about it at all. I, I don't find it to be, I mean, it's, it's weird because I'm in the biology department, but I, I don't find um, needing a definition for it. I don't find that particularly interesting. I spend all my time trying to figure out what the spectrum of cognition is. 
I spend pretty much zero time trying to figure out what what li- you know what kind of boundaries life might have. I, um, I'm not I'm not saying it's not a good thing to do. Like I said, there are people who who do good work on this field, but I I and that well and 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 the reason I tend to ignore it is mostly because I don't think there's any one to one relationship between life and cognition. So. I think that there are many things that that are co- that that have significant cognition that we wouldn't call alive, and vice versa. And um, I'm just I'm just much more interested in in the cognitive spectrum. I I, I don't know. I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not. I, I'm not sure what what my research program would gain by by uh, trying to come up with a with a category of life. Well, you already used the term synthetic life, though, and and that comes up a lot in your papers that I've read. So. How do you think of synthetic life? I mean, it just the the modifier synthetic suggests that it's in contrast to something at least. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I mean is, uh, and and we don't do the truly sort of minimal living systems when when you're down to the molecules where you, where it's really hard to to say what you're looking at. We generally you build things out of cells, out of existing cells, and so what's what's synthetic uh, to me is the fact that. What you've got as a large scale system is not something that came out of the evolutionary process on Earth. So, so something that was never here before, and that has certain interesting uh, implications that you can uh, derive from by studying it that uh, that you can't get from from natural systems that have had eons of selection pressures and all that kind of thing. There's something very special that happens when you can when you can create and study a system that has never had those particular selection pressures. So so that's what I mean by synthetic life is just something that's outside of the N of one example of the web of life that we have here on earth. And then just to further understand your thoughts on the definition of life, you mentioned Sarah Walker, the she's an, for our listeners who don't know, um, she's an astrobiologist, I think. And if she were looking at a another planet and there was something that clearly wasn't inert like a rock. It was moving around and something, moving around, doing sort of things, doing certain things. We might ask, it's a natural question, is this thing alive? And that might have important, I mean, moral implications that I think you would probably recognize. But what I'm wondering is, you're just saying it's not really a crucial theoretical question for you, is this thing alive? It's just more of a practical question. I don't even know. I don't even know if there are if if that will help you with significant moral questions. So this is uh, just kind of a standard uh, science fiction story from 150 years ago. You know, you're 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 sitting at home one day and the spaceship lands on your front lawn and this thing on wheels sort of trundles out and it's kind of metallic and shiny and uh, it 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 comes up to you and it hands you this poem that it wrote along the way about how happy it is to meet you and all that. So you're looking at this thing and you say, well, is it alive? I I, I don't know, but does that what, what what does that hang on and does it um does it determine your relationship with it right and so so i think i think in the end all of these thorny questions about how we ethically relate to other beings i don't think they're going to come down to questions of is it alive uh and that's and that's because i don't believe that that evolution and i don't believe that um protoplasm and you know kind of the squishy stuff we see in living forms on earth have any monopoly on creating morally important agents i think you could those can arise out of out of anything and in principle anyway and so so my relationship to that kind of being i i my first question is not going to be is it alive i'm going to have lots of lots of interesting questions about the cognitive level that it has right but but i don't think i'm gonna have any questions about whether whether it's alive so you know watching things move mm, you know, Roombas, Roombas move and they're not alive and, and so on. So I, 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 I'm just not sure of a lot of questions that get resolved by the life criterion as opposed to by the cognitive criterion. Hmm. Okay. And then there was, there's a term that, or a framework maybe is a better way of putting it that I see in a lot of your papers. And what I have in mind is a multi-scale competency architecture. And I'm wondering if just as we were talking about having a, a having good definitions is very important is a multi-scale competency architecture a way of talking about this a way of ma- capturing something useful about what we mean by life um uh, i think that uh well it's an interesting question as to whether life 
uh, entails, uh, you know, a thing, a thing, wh whether it's possible to have life that that is not using a multi-scale competency architecture. Um, well, maybe you could explain what what that is, since I didn't define it. Yeah, yeah. Um, just just very simply, what it means is that, I mean, we we all know we are a multi-scale system structurally. That is, you've got this you've got this um, uh, body. It may be part of some some group or swarm. But within the body, you've got organs, they've got tissues, they've got cells inside of them, they've got molecular networks inside of them. And so structurally, we know we're this kind of like nested doll hierarchy of, of scale. But, but my claim is that beyond structurally uh, nested, each one of those layers is also has also competencies in various spaces. So for example, individual cells have all kinds of interesting um, behaviors in gene expression space, in physiological space, in metabolic space. And then you get to collectives of cells, uh, meaning cells and tissues, and they have competencies in anatomical morphous space. So they they, they navigate uh, with a degree of intelligence. So there are certain clever things they can do. There are other things they can't do. Uh, and uh, they navigate that morphous space. And then on top of that, you've got this individual that, uh, that this at the scale of the whole body that has their own goals in three dimensional space, and that's behavior and so on, and and then, and then maybe there are larger systems above that. So uh, what comes along with this is the idea that you are made of parts with their own agendas and their own competencies, and that every higher level deforms the energy landscape for the for the systems under within it or underneath it, right? For the subsystems so that their competencies end up contributing to whatever the large scale goals are and eventually those goals and it's it's interesting there's a lot of competition but in and cooperation um the large scale system can do all kinds of stuff that's really not good for its parts uh but but big picture what you have is this like um uh deformation of of the option space for these cells so, so their company competencies end up being uh contributing to and 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 uh, uh being adaptive for the larger scale system so that's so that's the multi-scale competency i mean life as we know it, it uses that extensively um mo our our engineering and robotics generally doesn't i mean we have swarm robotics which is sort of you know climbing there but but um yeah. okay so I was going to ask if you would propose that it's a, a general feature of living things that they're comprised of a multi-scale competency architecture, the, the complexity of which might scale with the cognitive light cone of the creature in question. But as you said, I mean, robots, which are presumably somewhere on that intelligent spectrum, don't exhibit the same sort of multi-scale competency architecture yeah I, I don't know well it's an interesting empirical question as to as to whether a, a multi-scale competency architecture is required for high levels of intelligence I tend to think it probably is but certainly can't prove that um I uh I think that uh it's it's more about so so here so so if I had to define life here's here's what I would say um there are certain ways of arranging parts that do not scale their competencies. So individual particles, I, I will claim, and we can talk about it if you want, but, but I will claim that individual particles are not zero on that spectrum. They are in fact on that spectrum. Incredibly minimally, they have, they have certain nano competencies about doing very simple things. When you combine those, those particles into a giant rock, nothing has scaled up. That rock has basically exactly the same competencies as the parts have. And so that we don't call alive. There are other arrangements of things where you scale it in a way that where the system, where where the competencies scale. You've you've moved into new problem spaces. You have a co bigger cognitive light cone. You have uh, the, these kinds of things have grown. Anything that scales like that, I think we call it life. That would be my my weird definition of life: is that anything that really successfully scales the competencies of its of its components. Hmm. This uh, brings to mind. Uh, the the early chapters of Dawkins' book, uh, The Selfish Gene, where in the primordial ooze, you have these molecules that assemble and form competences and that they, maybe they, over time, as they evolve, they develop cell walls or flagella or something like this. And it, it really contrasts with the rock that is also just an agglomeration of molecules because one, as you put it, I mean, 
it evolves into new problem spaces and competencies while the other one doesn't. And the living one is the one that develops the multi-scale architecture. Yeah, fair. I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. So the last thing that I wanted to ask about before we get into some of some of the specifics is less conceptually charged, but it's just more of a term that I imagine many of our listeners won't be familiar with and limiting ourselves to cellular life for now, since I know the term has unrelated, I think they're unrelated uses in geology, but what is morphogenesis? Yeah. yeah. Um, so morphogenesis refers to the ability to, uh, well, I'll, I'll say it two different ways and then, and then, uh, We'll see how they they come together. So, so one the the traditional way of thinking about morphogenesis are systems that um, shape themselves in in uh, structurally or anatomically. So it's kind of interesting. I, I I think it's super interesting that Turing, who was obviously interested in uh, mind and computation and very, these these very um you know kind of uh, cognitive kinds of things, also wrote a paper on morphogenesis. He 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 wrote the, he wrote a paper on trying to understand how uh, this simple uh, well mixed um, chemicals can can have form can can cr create forms that are not just. A, uh, a random a random distribution. So morphogenesis, we see morphogenesis in every day in embryogenesis when you start with one cell and you end up with a with a frog or a human or an oak tree or whatever. That's morphogenesis. That's well, morpho is space, uh, and so and so it's the idea that uh, it's a process that uh, creates complex shape and structure. That morphogenesis happens in, in embryos. It happens during regeneration. So if you have a salamander, you cut off the, the leg, the leg will regrow. These cells are undergoing morphogenesis. They will make a leg. Uh, morphogenesis happens in metamorphosis when tadpoles become frogs or caterpillars become butterflies. Uh, morphogenesis has some interesting um, failure modes, such as cancer, where the cells uh, don't know what to build and they sort of uh, disrupt the, uh, the this kind of like this uh, dissociative identity disorder of that um, morphogenetic system. Uh, so that's 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 the conventional definition of morphogenesis. I'll, I'll I'll give a different definition, which I think means the same thing, but is a different way to think about it. Morphogenesis is a walk through anatomical morphous space. If you think about the a virtual space of all possible shapes that something can be, then changing shape, or from let's say from a single cell to um to to a, to a you know an embryo, or metamorphosis, or some kind of change in shape, or in fact even maintaining your shape while all the stuff within you changes, right? So molecules come in and out, cells die and are replaced. All this stuff is going on. Even standing still in morphous space is a very, is a very important process. So, so, so another way to think about morphogenesis is, is that it's a navigational task in anatomical space. And now there are some questions about how good are you at navigating this space? What kind of perturbations can you resist? Uh, what do you measure to know where you're going? What do you remember about where you're supposed to go? My 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 second definition recasts this problem into a very sort of cognitive sounding set of tasks, and that's on purpose. And I think and I think those are two 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 sides of the same two sides of the same coin. Limiting ourselves to that first definition for the moment, am I correct roughly that while on the one hand all of our cells contain our DNA, which is, I mean, their instruction manual, so to speak. And on the other, we're composed of bodies that exhibit certain observable characteristics like height and eye color and so on, our phenotypes. It's morphogenesis then that links the two, whereby the cells that constitute us or that execute on their instructions then take up the specific forms that determine what we are. Uh, well, yeah, the, the thing, the thing that's, de that the, the thing that uh, definitely is true is that morphogenesis is what sits between the genotype and the phenotype. And we often forget about that because people say, you know, the, or even when they do simulations, you got the genome and then you got this, this phenotype. Well, the DNA is actually not an instruction manual. The DNA, uh, is, a, is a hardware, is a description of your hardware that you have, the parts that the microscopic parts that every cell gets to have. So, so most of the hard work actually is done in that layer. So you've got your genome, you've created some hardware. Now that hardware has to do something, including assemble itself and then run various behavioral repertoires in different spaces. And then eventually you get to judge how well it did in that and selection can act on that. But, but all the heavy lifting is done in that middle layer because uh, for most things that we're interested in, there, are no, there, there isn't a gene for it. 
it's uh, you know there's a, there's a few like single cell single gene diseases and things like that but 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 the vast majority of um uh, of of the things we're interested in are very complex consequences of some amazing software that runs on this genetically specified hardware and that so that's physiology and so and so then once you realize that you can ask lots of interesting questions like what what is the competency level of that process and what does it know how to do and uh, what implications are there for evolution? In fact, um, you know, I, I've, I've written a little bit about this and now we, we're going to have some, some empirical work coming on this in a couple of months showing what, what happens to the evolutionary process when you're dealing with an agential material like cells that, that is not just a straightforward mapping from genotype to phenotype. Very interesting things happen when you do that. So um, yeah, morphogenesis is really key to a lot of these problems that people argue about. And then one last thing, you said that the morphogenesis is playing the the heavy role in that layer between genotype and phenotype. And am I right that over the past, I mean, fifty years, we've we've learned a lot about genes and we've learned a lot about DNA, but morphogenesis is really still a crucial missing part in our knowledge that is really important going forward and now? Yeah, well, I mean, it's certainly true that developmental biologists have known that morphogenesis is important for hundreds of years. And as and 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 many of many uh, of my colleagues uh, over the years, have highlighted all kinds of information about morphogenesis. So, so I definitely don't want to um, make the claim that which which sometimes you hear that claim too is that that no one knows how this works it's a total black box it's not a total black box people have discovered many interesting things about morphogenesis uh certain things we actually know how they work i mean there's been there's been a lot done developmental biologists have done a great job with a lot of it uh having said that i i do think that there are very crucial questions about morphogenesis that we haven't even gotten at all close to and uh uh, I could give you a couple of interesting examples, but like, you know, one of the things I say to my students is so, so, so we look at a developmental biology textbook and say, look, look at all these, you know, and then every chapter tells some stories, you, how does this work? How does that work? And I say, okay, let's look at the white space. Let's look at all the stuff that's not here. Like, what isn't here? What are, what are all the things that just isn't here? Because, because we don't know how to tell the story. So, so one, one very simple question um, I could pose is this. So let's say, uh, so, so, so ax axolotls, right? These little salamanders. So at baby axolotls have four, have legs and, um, uh, tadpoles of the frog, uh, do not have legs. And so in my lab, we make something known as a frogolotl. So a frogolotl is a bunch of uh, frog cells together with a bunch of axolotl cells. Do you mix them? And, and so now I can ask a very simple question. You have the frog genome. It's all sequenced, annotated. You have the axolotl genome. Can you tell me if the frogolotl is going to have legs or not? And that's a very similar question to, for example, planaria, these flatworms that regenerate, right? So, so you take two planaria with different head shapes, you cut off the head of one of the planaria, you repop, you, you take some, some, some of the um, neoblasts, the stem cells from the other, from the other type of worm, you, you put, put them into the first worm. Uh, what, what head shape is it going to have? Is it going to have, is one of the two head shapes going to be dominant? Is it going to be some in-between shape? Uh, is the head in fact going to switch back and forth between the two shapes because neither set of cells is ever satisfied about what what shape is there and it's going to try to break it down? You know, there's an old like Three Stooges uh, cartoon of them trying to uh, uh, trying to build a table or something and each one has a different idea of what they're building. And so of course, they just keep sawing and adding and so on. So uh, we've done a great job with genetics. We are, have a pretty good understanding of the hardware, I would say. But these kind of collective decisions, when the group of cells needs to decide what type of head to make or how, whether we're going to make legs or not, we, we, we're not even we're not even uh, at the beginning of having mature understanding of this. And this has massive implications for biomedicine, for limiting the technologies like CRISPR uh, and things like for DNA, DNA editing and all the things you can do with with genomes, because there is no easy mapping from a genome to uh, whatever you're interested in in the in the anatomical structure. Um, and that's why we talk about. Um, uh, the anatomical compiler as a sort of uh, far off aspirational goal, which we're nowhere nowhere near. Um, yeah, so I think it's both. I think I think there's plenty of information on on morphogenesis from the mechanistic side, and the decision making of it, the competencies, the problem solving, uh, we still are very bad at. I'd like to talk a bit more about the frogolotl. 
the first time I've I've said that word out loud. Am I right that this is what's referred to as a chimera, chimera in your lab? Okay, so because it is two types of life that are merged yeah, together. Yeah, it's a mix. And people have been, people have been making chimeras for for a really long time. It's it's very popular in the plant world. You can make I mean, one of the cool things about biology is that it's uh super um uh interoperable so you can mix all kinds of stuff and it just works and we can talk about why that is that's that's, that's an interesting uh, source i think but um yeah you can make chimeras out of all sorts of things well doesn't it just presumably work because all life runs on dna it's got the same instruction manual so to speak no oh no, no, you can make no i don't think that's true you can you can uh, this is why you know uh, so you can as you see papers every day we took cells and we put them on this weird uh, tungsten uh, you know alloy with this thing and we stuck some electrodes in there and then we use these nanomaterials and then we 3d printed the whole thing into a and it, it's you do, i don't know yeah no i don't think i don't think that's what it is i mean i mean it certainly helps that uh uh it, it certainly helps what uh to interface to things if they're making some of the same uh let's say um, range of signals and and so on which the dna contributes to by by determining some of the hardware but life is interoperable with all sorts of stuff that has no dna and has you know never been in the stream of life okay right no that makes sense and then returning though to the frog models how how specifically do you make one so, uh, so I'll tell you what we do. The the information that we have is rather limiting because uh, we're still very much. Uh, so, so I've been telling this this frogalotl story uh, for a long time because just conceptually, it's very obvious what the what the problem is. We haven't our, our work on it is not published yet. So until it's published and peer reviewed, I'm not going to say too too much about it. But but basically, what you do is you take early embryonic, uh, you take you take material from an early uh, frog embryo, you take material from an early axolotl, and you jam one set of cells into the other, and you let them sort it out, and eventually you get something. So the the question though that I guess I'm not understanding is, does the frogolotl have frog cells and axolotl cells, or it only has frogolotl cells? Uh, the cell, I, I see, uh, the cells do not, the, the, each cell stays, uh, the, the cells do not merge. So, so, so there are no frogolotl cells as such. There is, there are frog cells, there are axolotl cells, they are all completely inter, intermixed. You could make, now, now, you know, the cool thing about chimeras, and, and uh, my grad student Vasily and I um, wrote a review on this, uh, you can make chimeras at any level of organization. So people make chimeras all the time at the molecular level by taking genes, let's say DNA from one organism and shoving it into the cells from another organism. Then, then you have chimeric cells. We, this is not what we're doing. We have our, our the individual cells are staying, staying whole here. Right. And I, I was wondering if the issue was presuming that you were making these frogolotls at the molecular level, you would have access to the genome of the frogolotl, but because you could sequence it. But the problem is then that you still can't determine, even with the DNA, whether or not it would have legs. But that's not where the problem emerges. The problem it's, 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 it's a very similar, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely similar problem. You have, so, so the thing consists of two sets of cells. You have the genome for both sets of cells. So you've got the frog genome, you've got the axolotl genome, that's it. There is no DNA in this thing for which you do not have the complete sequence. You've got the complete sequence for every cell in this, in this organism. Right, but it still seems like a different question because you you have two sets of DNA and you're not sure how they are going to interact, these two groups of cells, versus having one set of DNA and you're just not sure how that whether or not that's going to produce. Well, life. you can go, I mean, you can, you can do it even simpler. Uh, if you didn't already know what a frog was and you didn't already have the other genomes to compare it with, if I gave you the frog genome, you couldn't tell me what it would look like. Just, just no, never mind the mixture. Just, just the one genome. You would have, you would have no way of telling me what this thing looks like if you didn't, if you couldn't compare with some other tetrapods and say, "Well, you know what? I think it's kind of a vertebrate." That, that's that's just that's cheating. That's by comparison with things you already know. But, but even even this even the single genome uh, gives you uh, g gives us gives us this problem because, and I'm not saying there's anything. Th th it's not that there's magic keeping us from discovering this. I'm saying that. The right answer to this is a, it's a collective intelligence problem. It's not a hardware problem. It's a problem of, of understanding 
how groups of cells make decisions and how that hardware leads to specific uh, specific outcomes. Hmm. So the point either way is that we just don't know enough about morphogenesis to determine this based on the gene. Well, I would say I would say slightly different. Uh, I would say we've been we've been asking a very limited set of questions. So so we've been asking lots and lots of really good questions about the hardware and certainly uh, uh, some people uh, are interested in how um, you know it, it, individual cells respond to various cues and things like that. There's plenty of that. Uh, what I'm saying is we've been missing the part where you have to understand how the collective navigates that anatomical morphous space. The the part where it stores memories, it can learn from experience, it uh, has the ability to decide between different uh, different options in that space and solve novel problems that it has never seen before, including evolutionarily. All of those are competencies that we have barely begun to study. And and mostly because people, people assume, f- philosophically, they just assume that they can't exist. They say, well, this is just a chemical system. Uh, therefore, I'm going to treat it like a kind of clockwork, at best a dynamical system. Um, and that's it. And that's my that's my whole point with this having this um, uh, spectrum uh, this this uh, spectrum of cognition <clears throat> is that you don't know where anything goes on that spectrum until you ch- until you try until you check. And if we sort of you think about um, uh, you think about a bowling ball on a on a landscape, and you 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 have a certain set of uh, tools that you're going to apply to know where the bowling ball is going to go on that landscape. And you really only have to worry about that landscape, right? The bowling ball brings very little of its own to it. It's everything is determined by the landscape. And then you have a mouse on a landscape. And then you have to use a completely different set of tools because the landscape is not nearly as important as the landscape that the mouse thinks it's on, right? The mouse's internal representation of that landscape, where what's good, what's bad, where does it want to go? Where did it have a good time last time or a bad time? That it's it's the it's the mouse's representation of that landscape that's really key if you're going to make predictions or try to control it. And so now you can ask the question: Are cells more like the bowling ball, or are they more like the mouse? And people make the assumption that they're more like the bowling ball, and I think that's completely wrong. But but the but the but the but the one thing I know for certain is that you can't answer that question by having feelings about it. You have to do experiments, and and that's what has. Re- I mean, we've been doing this for I don't know twenty five years now, and there's a there's there's other labs that do it too. But the vast majority of the community has barely scratched that surface. Hmm. And so the problem, if I heard correctly, is understanding the communication of the cells and how the collective navigates this amorphous space. And if I'm right, based on what I read, at least in part, this communication is mediated by bioelectric networks, which you have been working on. Yeah, yeah, the communication is part of it. It's uh, the communication is a critical part because I don't think you can have collective. Well, it's, it's interesting. I don't know. I don't think you can have a collective intelligence without communication between the parts. <clears throat> but it's not the only thing because because again, you can nail down, and, and in fact, people have nailed down the molecular details of how it works that cells signal to each other. That does not automatically give you uh, everything you want to know, which is which is what are the memories, preferences, goals, competencies, and so on of the collective. That requires a different set of tools that that beyond what uh, the molecular biology of how exactly do these cells talk to each other. But but the answer is, yeah, in, in large part, I mean, of course, they talk to each other chemically and biophysically, but bioelectrically is, is my favorite um, part of that modality. Hmm. Well, maybe we should talk about a specific organism or two. I know you, you, you wrote about physarum, which are a, a slime mold, but how do organisms like this, organisms without brains, communicate within the collective and exhibit cognition? Yeah. So, um, so, so the first, the first uh, thing to uh, think about is uh, wh- what other types of. So, if you, so if you don't have a brain and you don't have muscles, what kind of space can you possibly deploy cognition in? And <clears throat> my claim is that. There are many other spaces, including metabolic state space, uh, physiological state space, transcriptional state space, morphological or anatomical state space, uh, and so on. And none of those things require a brain. So all cells, and in fact, in some cases, things that are not cells, uh, navigate those uh, those kind of spaces. And some of them do it very cleverly and in very interesting ways that uh, is not just emergence. So a lot of people um, like emergence and complexity and they say, look, there are some simple rules. 
and and from the execution of these simple rules, outcome complex emergent things. And this is true from fractals on up. I mean, of course, that there is such a thing as emergence, but but this is much more than that. This is not just that some sort of complexity arises. What arises isn't complexity. What arises are goal seeking agents that have competencies to reach specific goals despite things going wrong or different. And and that's a very interesting thing that's beyond uh, plain old um, uh, emergence. And that happens at all the levels. So molecular networks can do this and then I'll know. So like a, a slime mold, for instance, it doesn't have a brain, it doesn't have muscles. The sorts of problems that it might have to solve are how to repair itself, how to eat, how to dispose of waste. And so, these are the... so... Oh, go ahead. Well, so, so, so I'll give you an example of a couple of uh, Pfizer problems, and then, and then let's let's talk about that. Then I'll tell you about a, a different uh, navigational problem in, uh, for a cell um, that I think is is a better example. So, so Pfizer. So, so here's here lots of lots of amazing people uh, study Pfizer intelligence, and it solves all kinds of uh, problems, including the traveling salesman problem and 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 some <laughs> other stuff. But um, uh, but but here's 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 what we did. Uh, you have a petri dish, six uh, six uh, centimeter uh, petri dish, <clears throat> and you um, you put a little uh, piece of arm in the in the center, and then you got these glass discs. These are very thin, very light glass discs. They're inert. They're just glass. There's no food on them. Nothing. Just glass. So what you do is you put one piece of glass disc, one glass disc on one side. You put three on the other side. And what you'll see is that, uh, and when uh, this is uh, uh, Norosha Morugan's uh, work in my group, and, and you can see some videos of this attached to the paper, what the Pfizerum will do is it first for a few hours, it grows symmetrically around its, you know, that initial point, it kind of grows outwards like this. And then boom, it makes a beeline for the three disks. And so what it's done in the meantime, now, how does it know where the three disks are at a distance? What it's doing all the time, if you watch it really carefully, what it's doing is it's gently pulsing and tugging on the medium that it's on. So it's on this like rubbery agar kind of medium and it's pulling on it and then it's reading the strain angle that comes back. And by reading that strain angle, it can get a sort of representational map of what the objects, the mass of the objects are around it. So um, so for those few hours where it's growing uh, 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 evenly, what it's doing is collecting data and processing that data and figuring out now up until that point, it hasn't actually made a decision, it hasn't gone anywhere. So what you see is these clear phases of collecting the information and then <clears throat> acting, <clears throat> excuse me, acting on that on that information. Now, why it's doing this, I haven't a clue. Uh, this is just one of these things that uh, that and then and, and of course, there's many I mean, they so 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 they can anticipate um, patterned events and they can, uh, they, they can solve a whole bunch of other, other kinds of problems. So that's, so they now, now one interesting in Pfizerum, the thing in Pfizerum is that <clears throat> in that case, cutting it up as an observer, as a scientist looking at it, if I decide to, if I, if I think I have a very clear distinction between three-dimensional space and morphogenetic space, Pfizerum is going to keep me humble by saying, well, for me, those are the same thing because my behavior is changing my shape. That's how I do behavior. So, so it's sh it's it's motion through three dimensional space is literally by changing its shape and uh, growing up. So that that reminds us that we we, uh, we you know we can't we can't be rigid about these things. We have to we have to change our frame depending on the organism. But I want to um I want to talk a little bit about uh you know you were talking about the wastes and stuff. I want to this is one of my favorite examples um uh, that uh, we we discovered a few a few years ago um. And uh, my student uh, uh, Maya Emmons Bell and Angela Tung uh, worked on this. Uh, you got these planaria, these flatworms. Um, you put them in a the solution of barium, and their heads explode overnight. Literally, their heads explode, and that's because <clears throat> barium is a non-specific potassium channel blocker. Their heads are full of neurons. The neurons are really unhappy if they can't pass potassium, so there's excited toxicity. The whole thing, the whole thing blows up. Well, if you leave them in the barium. In a couple of weeks, they grow back a new head, and the new head is fine in the barium. And uh, and we were looking and saying, how is that possible? What what? Well, how can they survive here? And so what we did was we did a, a transcriptional profiling of normal heads versus barium adapted heads, right? Just to ask what's what's the transcription? Well, what genes are different? And, and then of course it didn't have the difference didn't have to be in the genes at all, right? So but but that's the tool we had, so we decided to look. There's only there's only a couple of dozen genes that are different, and uh, the kicker is the most important part of this story is this: Planaria have never seen barium in their evolutionary history. You don't you don't find pools of barium in the wild. 
So just imagine this 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 problem. Um, yeah, yeah, you've got this. You've got I don't know ten to twenty thousand genes. You are hit with a stressor, a physiological stressor that you've never seen before. Which of those genes am I going to up and down regulate? You don't have time to do what bacteria often do, which is uh, to have a, a rare mutant that everybody else dies and the rare mutant repopulates, right? You don't have time for that bacteria. Um, planaria cells don't turn over that fast. You don't have time for gradient descent because that will take too long. And also, if you turn up and down the wrong genes, you, you're going to kill yourself long before you find out if this is good for barium or not. So I always visualize like you're sitting, you ever seen a picture, um, the inside of a nuclear reactor is like buttons everywhere, right? Buttons and lights just as far as the eye could see, but you know, low controls all over the place and the thing's melting down. What do you, what, what do you, what do you do? So, so the ability, so, so now what you're, what you have here is a navigation through a high dimensional space, the space of possible gene expressions that you could have. Let's say there's, I don't know, 20,000 genes. Uh, that's how many dimensions you have in your space and you have to navigate it from where you are now, which is you're not happy over to some ensemble of states where the right genes are just, just the right 12, you know, or 15 genes are on that's going to enable you to solve this physiological problem, which you've never seen before. So that ability to navigate the space uh, in terms of novelty, th th that's the sort of thing. I mean, your body cells are doing this all the time. I, in fact, I think, and it's kind of weird to think about, but I think, you know, our, our, our ability to uh, recognize intelligence is really uh optimized for medium-sized objects moving at medium speeds through three-dimensional space so so all of our sense organs point outwards we're like we can recognize uh, primates uh, crows uh you know parrots maybe dolphins uh, things like that right we, we're pretty good at that not, not great but you know okay uh but imagine imagine if we evolved with a primary sense of your blood chemistry imagine you had like a tongue or something inside where you could you could constantly feel 20 different parameters of your blood chemistry. I think in that case, A, we would live in a high dimensional space and we would know that we would, we would feel internally. We're not, it's not just this, it's this like this, this high dimensional space. And I think we would have no problem recognizing our liver, our kidneys and various other organs as intelligent agents navigating that space. Because you would, you would say, oh, I ate this thing. And it's new and it's you know it's it's really disruptive to my physiology but look my body's adapted because i've taken this walk in 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 physiological space amazing so so i think at that point we would we would have such a such a much better intuitive understanding of of these unconventional spaces um now you're we're not you're really successfully changing the way that i think about i'm thinking about intelligence which is which is great before i ask a more substantive question. How did you discover this about the planaria? Did you just leave them out for a few weeks? Uh, you were too lazy to clean them up or something after their heads exploded. And then you discovered that they regrew brains or how did that happen? No, I mean, uh, so, so for a lot of these, for a lot of these things, uh, what you do is you 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 do the experiment. You do an experiment. So you, so you put them in the you put them in the barium. The the reason we put them in the barium in the first place was because we were mod we were trying to modify the bioelectric circuits that control the head regeneration, and uh, so we saw that the barium was kind of toxic, and it was blowing up the heads. And we knew planaria was regenerative, and we just we had a discussion about the data, and we said you know leave them in there because. Who knows what will regenerate? We thought we thought we thought it would regenerate something. I I I will say I did not re I did not expect that it would regrow a perfectly normal head. I th I thought there would be some sort of regeneration. I thought it would be uh, aberrant. I thought that maybe it would get confused and make a tail. Uh, maybe it would make a head without neurons. Uh, we thought I, I thought it would do something. So so I said leave them, you know leave them leave them there and let's see. And uh, and this is one of those things that that I think is really profound because I'll tell you something else that's that's I think a um a, a kind of a, an important implication of this. It the reason that Lamarckian inheritance doesn't work, right? Let's so so let's just remind ourselves, right? So 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 the original idea is you're a, you're a, the the what's what's associated with Lamarckism uh, is that you're a giraffe and you keep struggling to reach the higher branches. And because of that, your offspring, right? So your genetic material gets modified and your offspring will have higher necks, longer necks because of it. That's the original idea. The reason that doesn't work is not the reason that they commonly tell students, which is this Weissman's barrier idea that, well, your germ cells are set aside. 
and and so so they can't be accessed. That's not why we now know that it's. Of course, you can you can. Uh, there are many epigenetic um, kinds of uh, processes that uh, that will uh, will affect your germline. That that's not the problem. The the deeper conceptual problem is that there is no gene for neck length. There's no single gene for neck length. So the question. So the point is, if you whether you're the giraffe or a bioengineer or whoever, if you want a longer neck, it is completely unknown what genes would you change. And development is so um, sort of recurrent and, and complex that you can't invert it. You can't run it backwards and say, "Oh yes, these are the genes that right." So, so that doesn't that that doesn't work. So, so that's that's typically the reason. And from until I saw this result, until which was what I don't know, twenty nineteen, no, twenty eighteen, I think is the first time I saw this. Until I saw this result, I really thought that no, there's a fundamental reason why strong Lamarckism doesn't work. It's because you can't tell which genes to change to to improve things. But now, if it's the case that cells can solve a novel problem and figure out at least roughly, let's say let's say out of those twenty genes that were modified, uh, let's say only one of them really matters for being able to survive in barium, right? Because we don't know that they're all important. Maybe it's clo- it got you know maybe maybe it, it's not a it, it's not the minimal set, but it's a pretty small set. Okay, fine. If cells are good at figuring out which genes. Can resolve a physiological stressor. I mean, my God, that that solves the biggest problem of this kind of inheritance. The rest is easy once you figure out which transcript you want. I mean, editing the ge- editing the genome is not hard. There are many mechanisms inside cells that can rewrite, you know, edit DNA. That's that's not the hard part. The hard part is figuring out well, which genes are even relevant. But these cells are telling us they can t- they can figure it out. And I don't know how this is a very, you know, this is a single study with actually there's one more like it for a different drug, but um, we don't know how general this is. We don't know what kinds of problems it can solve. We're going to find all this out. Obviously, my lab is studying it. But if if this is generic and if cells generally have the ability to figure out what parts of their genome are the right thing to tinker with to solve a new physiological stressor, that has massive implications potentially for 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 evolution. So that's the sort of thing, that's what I mean when focusing your attention on how cells make decisions, how they navigate these spaces, what are their competencies, what do they know, what do they measure, what do they remember? This is, I think, the, the key to a lot of um, new biology. Hmm. I'd like to continue with this example of the planarium and returning to the framework we began with, how do you describe or think about the intelligence of the planaria or relate it back to this notion of the cognitive light cone and an understanding of intelligence as relating to entertaining different ways of solving problems and thus place it somewhere on this spectrum? Well, uh, I, I only know two things for sure. The one thing I know for sure is that there are multiple levels at which you ask that question. So behaviorally, right? So they have certain competencies in behavioral essays. They have other competencies in physiology and morphous space. Their, their, their intelligence in anatomical morphous space is sky high because you, you can cut that thing into, into, I think the record is 275 pieces. You can do some amazing things and every piece will be able to navigate that anatomical space to get back to a perfect little worm. It's, it's, it's incredible. Uh, so, so one thing I know is that is that it's not just one type of intelligence. It has many different, like all of us do, it has many different types of intelligence in different spaces. And the other thing I know for sure is that we are nowhere near smart enough to recognize all of those uh, level, all, all of those those competencies. We are just scratching the surface of figuring out what these things can do. Hmm. Okay, that's very neat. So, one, their intelligence in I think you called it anatomical amorphous space is much higher than ours, which which is pretty amazing because I I think if you ask the average person on the street, is a planaria smarter than you, they're going to say in no dimension, in no dimension, are they as smart as us? So that's interesting. And then also going back to this problem of binaries in intelligence, having multiple intelligences. Also, I can see it, it does not constrain research. It opens up room for research and more understanding of the planaria, especially when you don't go in to the problem uh, already biased, uh, and thinking it's not intelligent, that just doesn't motivate you to do more research. That's that's right. That's right. If you if you if you think you know which set of tools to apply, so so one of the one of, an, another way to think about that spectrum of I I actually called it in my in my tame paper um, where I outline all this stuff. Uh, I call it the spectrum of persuadability. 
because what you're what you're trying to do it's very engineering and tame stands for technological approach to minds everywhere it's a technological approach meaning that it's all about put yourself in the perspective of an engineer you want to be able to predict and change the way the system functions what tools are you going to use to do that so so in in my original um kind of di uh, diagram of the spectrum there are some mechanical clocks over here and then some thermostats and then some some animals and then some humans and so on and so so if you are convinced that the only tools you can bring to bear on the system, tool, tools meaning, I mean, practical techniques and concepts, right? That, that the only tools you're going to have are the kind that are appropriate to mechanical clocks, meaning hardware rewiring, and that includes DNA and protein engineering and all these kind of things, then that's a set of things you're going to be able to achieve. But what if your system is also amenable to the tools of cybernetics, like rewriting goal states and, and looking at uh, uh, set points of, of homeostatic uh, processes? And what if your system actually has is amenable to the tools of behavior science? Because maybe it learns from experience. Maybe it offers habituation, sensitization, associative learning, uh, you know, path finding, all these kinds of things. Maybe your system is even higher on the spectrum and it, and it can do planning and it can do um, uh, representation and counterfactual thought and, and language and who knows, right? So, so it's all about constraining or facilitating research is does it does it encourage me does this framework encourage me to try tools from other disciplines to see what i'm really dealing with or does it constrain me to say this is my toolbox and it's danger you know, there's a real kind of teleophobia around uh using other tools that are normally used let's say in behavioral science for things that are unconventional systems because people say well it's a slippery slope you can you know you you, you can really attribute too much mind to things I mean, yes, but the slope is much slipperier in the other direction. You know, if if you if you assume that you're dealing with with a dumb machine when you're not, that's actually in terms of ethics and so on. That that's a much more dangerous slippery slope. So I I, I always argue for trying to get it right. You know, do doing empirical question empirical uh, work to determine where your thing is on that continuum. Discussing examples like the planary and the frogolotl, I think have been really helpful. And I'm curious now about how you've approached some of these problems using synthetic life, which we haven't really discussed yet. So what does using synthetic life allow you to do that you can't with chimeras or planaria or would otherwise just be more difficult with conventional means? Yeah, well, uh, let's let's focus on one, one in particular, which is kind of my favorite. Um, one of the uh, just to take it back a little bit one of the the things that that i've been saying and other people of course have been saying too that a lot of people uh are really not happy with is this notion of goal directedness the idea that all that that all of these systems have have goals and uh typically speaking the people who are okay with it at least are able to what they do is they ground those goals in evolution so so if you say that this system has goals. When I say goals, I don't mean human level purpose, meaning I know that I have goals. I don't mean that. I mean the kind of thing, the cybernetic, the, the kind of goals that your thermostat might have or that your kidney might have and so on. These are these are, these are um, set points for homeostatic or homeodynamic processes. So, uh, so if you ask where do these goals come from, for any typical living agent that has evolved in the Earth's biosphere, the answer is simple. Well, eons of, of selection, of course. Right, so so the goals, where do they come from? Oh, well, they come from selection and evolution. And so, what I like about uh, synthetic organisms is that if you make things that are competent in a way that in a in a configuration that's never existed before on Earth, then what you can't say is that that competency has arisen by specific selection. It it has to have been. So so th so that raises. I mean, I, I I like the I like was it Bohr? I think it was Bohr that said that. Um, he said, "Oh, oh, good, a paradox. Now, now we have a chance of making progress." So I like that. I like. I, I think that's true. I think. I think you. We. We should try to push some of these concepts to the limit. And when when we reach a wall, that's where we have the ability to make some progress. And ask if if it's not the case that evolution evolves produces specific solutions to specific problems, right? So it's been. 50 million years or however many of a froggy environment. And so we've evolved a nice organism that kind of matches all those criteria. Um, what does evolution produce? And I think what evolution produces is problem solving machines that can do many things in addition to the thing that they typically do. And this also gets back to, we can talk about that if you want this, this issue of why, why life is so interoperable. 
um, we can talk about this uh, kind of uh, play play the hand you're dealt idea, but um, but 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 anyway. So so what's cool about synthetic life is that you get to make things that have never been here on Earth, and then you get to look at their competencies, uh, and then you get to if if you find them, you get to ask the question: how, how did how did they get here? Like why why is it good at this? And so that's what we've been doing, and um, we've had we've had a few papers on these things called xenobots, which are basically uh, made of made of frog scales, the frog cells. Um, we have a couple of other papers, which again, I can't go into too much because they're not uh, peer reviewed yet, but soon in a, in a couple of months, there'll be some, uh, I think there's some, some dynamite stuff coming out, uh, looking at a very different version of, uh, of, of these, of these uh, synthetic living beings. Um, yeah. And they have, they have all kinds of interesting uh, capabilities that, uh, have never been directly selected for. So the first thing to ask is my understanding is that in a laboratory environment, nobody has been able to r make from the ground up a, a a cell. But when you're not making xenobots, which I, or things like xenobots that are that come from biological material, what sort of artificial life are you or synthetic life are we able to produce at this point? Um, so or does it so all I'm come a, in this? Yeah, way? I, I'm well. Uh... So, so that's an interesting thing. Uh, and, and, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not the expert on, on minimal, minimal living, um, kind of, uh, systems, but, uh, what we do have are things like, um, have you seen, have you seen the work on droplets and, and molecular chemotactic? There's some amazing stuff, um, on, uh, very simple chemical sig sig systems. We're talking, we're talking three chemicals at most together. So this is not some crazy complicated thing. Uh, inorganic, uh, in the sense, I mean, they're not produced by, they're not, they don't come from a living thing. Uh, and they do all kinds of amazing stuff. They solve mazes and they have various behaviors. Uh, you know, there's, there's people, there's people um, studying this. Um, so, uh, now, now whether or not you would call that alive basically just gets back to our earlier point of alive is not a great binary category. It doesn't re wrestling over whether these things are alive is to me not interesting at all. What's interesting is what kind of competencies can you get from even a, an extremely simple system? There's even there's even a thing now called uh, molecular chemotaxis. So it, so there's bacterial chemotaxis where bacteria can f can can follow a gradient, right? Well, it turns out single molecules can do it too, and <clears throat> and and this is where you find out that uh, you get into these really troublesome cases where you don't know if you should call it alive, and that's fine as far as i'm concerned there's no need to have a binary category of this that's not that's not the interesting part and, and you know it's going to be you, you know from the start that it's going to be a hard thing because we said we are looking for minimal transitional forms is it right because because it's it's like it's like with with cognition when when people when people ask me uh what is the what is the lowest uh, form of cognition what's at the very end of your of your spectrum and so i'll say what it is and then people say but that's that that's not cognition. I mean, I have cognition. That's kind of yeah. But you ask for the lowest form. Of course, it's going to seem like you know uh, it's going to it's going to seem primitive. Like that that's the point. And uh, of course, it has to because because then it then then it has to scale up. We're looking at the left end of the spectrum, and the same thing for these minimal systems. So I have no idea if you want to call them alive or not. Uh, they certainly have. They're certainly telling us that we do not have a good intuition on how to predict um competencies from knowing the parts and i think i think that's also playing out in ai right now as well then for the moment let's just stick to xenobots and first i mean if they come from frog cells what is it that makes them synthetic um well that's that's interesting so so specifically what we have not done and this is on purpose um, and this is, by the way, uh, just to say, this is uh, this is collaborative work with uh, Josh Bongard's lab at University of Vermont. This is Doug Blackiston in my group who does all the biology, and Sam Kriegman um, from UVM now at Northwestern did all of the uh, the, the the coding for it. Um, what we specifically did not do is the thing that most people do, which is to put in synthetic circuits, nanomaterials, basically really engineer the thing. We we will, and you can, and we will. Ultimately, we're going to do all of that. But um, the reason we didn't do it is specifically because I, I, I'm really interested in the native competencies of these systems that I, I don't want somebody to look at them, to look at it and say, 
oh, well, they put in a circuit that makes them do this and that. Yeah, of course, they engineer the thing to do it. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that later. But, but to, for me, the more important thing is, no, actually, we didn't have to do any of that. This is a standard frog genome. We've made no changes. There's no nanomaterials. There's no, no drugs, no, no uh, synbio circuits, nothing. This is what these cells already know how to do in a, in a new environment. And so what's synthetic about it is that we liberate these cells from the normal, their normal place in the embryo. That we find out that that you know if if you um, they're, they're skin cells yeah so they're, they're they're ectodermal cells if you if you ask uh, what what are the competencies of ectodermal cells and you think well it's pretty clear they they make a nice boring two dimensional layer on the outside of the embryo and they sort of keep out the bacteria that's what they can do yeah that's what the default situation is but when you liberate them from that context you find out that actually they were only doing that because they were bullied into it by the other cells. They were basically the other cells' behavior shaped them into um, into doing this kind of thing and having that kind of role. When you liberate them from that environment, you find out what they actually uh, are capable of, which is you know you take these skin cells and you put them you 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 dissociate them and you put them in a in a petri dish. There are many things they could do, right? They could die. They could run away from each other. They and spread out. They could form a nice flat monolayer like cell culture. Um, they could do nothing. That's not the, the, none of those things are what they do. What they really do is they come together, they form this 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 little ball, and that little ball has little motile hairs on the outside, which are normally used by the frog to um, keep the mucus flowing and keep the pathogens from sticking. Right, and so this is constant like flow of mucus down the frog. Uh, well, instead of that, the xenobots are using those little little cilia to row against the water, and they move. And they can they can move in circles. They can go back and forth. They can. Uh, there's some amazing videos that are attached to some of our papers where they 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 do a maze and they sort of take turns before they bump into the outside wall. And at some point, they just spontaneously turn around and, and go back where they come from. Um, and that's just the beginning. I mean, they do kinematic self replication, uh, which is just amazing. I, I I believe we haven't even scratched the surface of what these things can do. We have some, uh, like I said, we have some other work that will come out in a couple of months where. It's just it's just mind blowing uh, what 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 competencies are there, and uh, yeah, and and there's never been any xenobots. There's never been selection to be a good xenobot. There's never been any kinematic self replication. No other no other creature reproduces this way, uh, and yet and yet they, you know there it is. So so it's a minimal. It's a really minimal system for asking what does evolution? What did evolution really learn when making a frog? What does it produce? And what does the frog genome actually do? And you might think that, well, of course it makes frogs. What else could it possibly do? I'm like, no, the, G the, the frog genome creates hardware that is actually competent to do a number of different things. And you can also, another favorite example of mine, I'm really sort of obsessed with, with these things now, is uh, plant galls. So if you've ever seen these weird shapes, some of them are amazing, right? I mean, I mean amazing that the structure, if you ask what the acorn genome encodes, you say, well, it encodes a nice flat green leaf. That's what it encodes. That's what happens, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time. But in fact, if you prompt it with the whatever signals the wasp embryo is putting out, no, actually it can make all kinds of stuff. And it makes these amazing structures, these amazing three-dimensional structures. And again, no, no, no genetic change. These are just some, these are just some signals that the that the that the bioengineer of oh, being a while of a wasp, and I think in that case the wasp is a sort of uh, you know an, an unknowing bioengineer has has uh, has prompted these cells to build the, the, a, a structure that's completely not you know not the default structure. So that's that's what I think is important about these these kinds of uh, synthetic forms is that you find out you get to so to put it another way, um, uh, people have asked what 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 the xenobot is, and I used to say well it's a biorobotics platform and it's Actually, I don't think that's right. I, th well, I mean, it's true, but it's more than that. What I think a xenobot really is, and all these synthetic uh, kind of uh, things that, we're, that, that we and others are going to be making, um, they're a periscope. They're a kind of uh, device, a, a, a discovery platform that you can stick into the latent space around that genome and ask, what is it actually competent in doing? There's this invisible space around each genome where we tend to know we tend to know one at best, and some some plant uh, kind of botanists and so on know a couple because some plants have different forms depending on um, conditions, and so they kind of know that these um, there's developmental plasticity and so on. But but really, there's a there's a huge space around every standard genome, and these synthetic synthetic constructs are a way to a tool to explore that space. So natural selection determines what 
the Xenobot cells would have done were they in the frog and and they would be doing froggy things. But what is it that you think is prompting their their cognition and their purpose and what they're doing when they're true Xenobots and they're removed from the frog? I mean, they they, they certainly are doing things, but why? Yeah, they're doing things. That was, so, so I want to be super clear. We have made no claims at all about their behavioral cognition. We, we will have a paper out later this year about their ability to learn and some other things, but we've yet no made we've yet made no claims about that. So so people will, you know will often say, well, uh, you know uh, how, how uh, you you know you think they're they, how 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 cognitive do you think they are? We we don't know. We haven't uh, we haven't made any claims about that. Um, and uh, the, 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 as as far as uh, their various other competencies, we're just beginning to 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 scratch the surface. So I think what determines it long, you know, kind of, in, and here we're going beyond what we've shown. So this is kind of me just um, uh, uh, brainstorming or, or throwing out ideas for, I think what's happening here. I think that architectures where the genome tells you exactly what you're going to do. And, and, and I mean, there may be some animals like that. I think maybe C. elegans might be a little bit like that, um, but overall, this kind of this kind of architecture where the genome tells you exactly what you are, you're matched to a specific environment. I think those generally tend to die out. I think a much more successful architecture is to invest in the, for the genome to invest in making hardware that can do multiple many different things. So I think what evolution mostly produces is problem solving machines or problem solving agents. And depending on the environment, those agents will do all kinds of interesting things. And so uh, this is why even human embryos, if you cut them into pieces early on, you'll get multiple, you know, you'll get twins and triplets and things like that. You don't get half bodies. It's because all, all of these cells have various competencies. The collectives have various competencies and uh, <clears throat> and they do all kinds of, uh, they, yeah, they solve problems. They're not tied. This, this goes back to this issue of why life is so interoperative because I think evolution does actually doesn't, and this is of course super super controversial, and a lot of people won't be happy with this. But I, I think in a lot of ways, evolution does not take past history very seriously. It does not overtrain. It it produces gen generalized problem solving machines that are not bound to the problems you've solved in the past. I mean, they're shaped by it to some extent, but but they're not limited to the problems you solved in the past. The hardware is, and 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 I, and I think here the distinction, the right, the computer science notion of of hardware and software. Is really good. I mean, people get upset about um, using computer metaphors for life, and obviously, the kind of computer architectures we have now—that's not how life works. But there is something that is good about that software analogy, which is that we know we know that uh, some hardware is reprogrammable. That if you have uh, a description of that hardware, it does not fundamentally uh, prescribe what the hardware is going to do. Right, it has many different software modes that experiences can can change it, and there's there's lots of you know hardware is just the beginning. We 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 don't stop at the hardware level. And I think that's that's where biology and medicine have been is stuck at the hardware level. Everybody's into the molecular hardware, the genes, the proteins. That and that's great. You have to understand that stuff. You have to know your hardware. But but all the fun starts after that, as far mm -hmm. as I'm concerned. Well, speaking of the fun, I mean, we didn't get to much of the practical dimensions of your work, even if we we did hint at. Uh, say the the potential for regenerative regenerative medicine that would come from a better understanding of morphogenesis. But the last thing I'll ask today, just briefly, is where you see this research on xenobots going for the future. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I see I see impacts, and 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 again, it's going to be uh, well below, well well beyond. Um, uh, Xenobots. So we're 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 making uh, various uh, biobots and other things out of other other types of uh, uh, material. But um, I, I see three broad areas of of impact. So the most obvious is going to be useful synthetic living machines. So we're talking about things that uh, help clean up the environment, that do various uh, tasks in the lab, that sculpt uh, uh, growing cultures of things in vitro, that uh, carry out sensing uh, tasks. There's a million. Uh, there's a million useful things. Once we learn to program them, and that's kind of a, a next step, is to learn to program their structure and function. You can make all kinds of useful living machines. So that that's kind of obvious. The the second thing, which is less obvious, is that uh, I think there are kind of 
did, did a test bed for learning the rules of morphogenesis. So, so we want to understand, you know, my long-term goal and this, as, a, as many people in the field is a kind of anatomical compiler, this idea that you draw the anatomy that you want, and then it figures out what, what stimuli does it need to give to cells to get them to do, to, to build exactly that. And it could be anything. Uh, and so, so, so I think that these platforms are a test bed for exactly that, right? For cracking that code, for figuring out how do we, for any given desired anatomy, how do we figure out what signals to, to give it? So that's kind of the second thing as a, as a platform for cracking this this morphogenetic code. And then the third thing is, I think what these things are really going to be good for is to shake us out of our um, pre scientific limitations that have that have shaped our ethical systems. Meaning that I mean the best thing is is if some weird decomposition alien were to land and and we would just have to deal with it once and for all. But but the, you know if that can't happen for now anyway, then what what we have are these synthetic beings that break all of the binary categories. And so so people people argue about this all the time. Are, are they machines? Are they organisms? Are they uh, you know what 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 are they right? And and I'm like yes, the reason we're having trouble with this is because all those categories were were terrible to begin with. They used to they used to do okay back in the day. Back in the day, uh, you could you if, if somebody if you were presented with a new system, you 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 would knock on it, and if you heard a metallic clanging sound, you would you could conclude many things. You would say, ah, it came out of a factory. It's going to be rather boring. Uh, and I'm ethically allowed to do whatever I, I want and take it apart and you know make it into a vacuum cleaner and it's fine. Um, or you would you would sort of do that and you get this like 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 uh, you know soft uh, kind of thing and you say ah this was produced by evolution and uh, I, I need to be nice to it because it can suffer and all these kinds of things right ideally that's the ideal case we haven't been good with that either but but ideally but that's the ideal case that is not going to work anymore and and for good reason those categories are, are were never good but they you know so, but now they're really going to break and so um, in the future. I think not just Xenobots, but um, over the next decades, uh, we are going to be surrounded by creatures that are nowhere on the tree of life with us. This old thing where you say, well, that kind of looks like a fish. I, I know what we owe fish and how we relate to fish. So that's how we're going to, you're going to, we're, we're going to see cyborgs and hybrids and humans with implants and robots with human cells on board and weird animals that never existed before and just all kinds of stuff which is going to completely break this this uh, completely um, kind of a superficial and and really uh, uh, primitive notion of of how we determine how we relate to things and uh, and and that's good and we and 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 that that needs to go and and we need to develop new ethical systems that are uh, based on 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 real on real deep and fundamental aspects that all cognitive agents have in common so that's that's what I that that I think is going to be the not not just it's not just Xenobots it's all it's all this other stuff uh, basically that that how you got here meaning were you designed were you were you uh, evolved uh, or some combination thereof or what you're made of all of that stuff needs to go as the basis of, of ethical frameworks. Well, Michael, this has been so cool. I mean, a hundred and. 50 some episodes in, and these are all very new ideas to the podcast. So thanks so much for sharing some of your work with me and our listeners. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks for the great discussion. Yeah. Very cool. Hold on. If you haven't subscribed, liked, commented, or reviewed, that would be so helpful. And if you haven't yet, you could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Robinson Earhart.